So Dr. Lisa Brown, who will be our grand round speaker today, and as you all know, is one of our, our cardiothoracic surgery faculty, um, actually uh, went to uh, college and medical school uh, in Wisconsin, for, first at the University of Wisconsin and then the Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, before she went on to do her general surgery training at UCSF and then her cardiothoracic fellowship at uh, Barnes Jewish at the um, uh, Wash U, Washington University in St. Louis. That was then followed by some, uh, fellow, some additional fellowship time at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York and an advanced minimally invasive uh, thoracic and foregut surgery fellowship at uh, Swedish Medical Center in uh, Seattle. So also with an interest in uh, health services research and outcomes research that she's going to talk to us ab about today. But I just think it's sort of unique and a great um, tribute to the great state of Wisconsin to have such uh, outstanding uh, leaders coming from the Midwest. So with that, I just will uh, uh, want to introduce Dr. Brown and look forward to your conversations this morning about uh, patient-centered approach to pain management in cardiothoracic patients. Go cheese heads. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks for the introduction. And it's uh, funny you said go cheese heads because I just went paleo, so I gave up cheese and dairy, so that's, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> it's probably not gonna work, but we'll give it a shot. <clears throat> Well, California does do after you've been here a while, huh? So I'm going to talk to you today about a patient-centered approach to pain management for lung cancer surgery. And here is the outline. This is mainly lung cancer resection patients. We'll talk a little bit about the scope of the problem, patient part outcomes, pain, and opioid use. And then throughout the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, establishing a research focus. And I'm just going to sprinkle in some ideas and some advice I got along the way. And then lastly, this is, uh, a lot of the work was done as part of the KL2, and I recently applied for a KO8. So this is uh, a work in progress and evolution. So we always start with these types of slides, right? Well, what's the magnitude of this problem? So lung cancer uh, is, is very common, and you can see by the numbers, and it's in fact, it's 13% of all new cancer cases in the United States. And it's the number one killer, number one cancer killer over breast and, and, uh, and prostate cancer. And you can see by stage, we still have a lot of work to do, but a lot of patients have distant METs, but there's still plenty of patients with localized disease or regional disease who are surgical candidates. And so it was in 2019, they haven't updated their uh, website quite yet with 2020 projections, but that's 87,000 people with either localized or regional lung cancer have surgery. That's a lot of patients. Survival. Uh, every year, our staging system, just like all the others, gets more and more complex, and you can see by the lines there, we've got more stages now. And long-term survival is great, so especially for the earlier stages, 92% for one A1. So health-related quality of life after lung cancer surgery is very important. You all know this. These are the types of resections we do. They may be sublobar. They may be a lobectomy. Uh, these are the ones we focus on the most because pneumonectomy is quite rare that, uh, that that would be indicated. And again, these are the approaches. It's either open, video assisted, or robot assisted. So I'd like you to think about your own specialties too and you think about what is a good surgical outcome. So if you go to the databases, these are the metrics that you get. Morbidity, mortality, length of stay, readmission. This is what we focus on constantly and continuously. But I like this slide. So on the bottom you see we have clinical outcomes and I'd say we're very, very good at defining those and predicting those. But what about uh, the y-axis there, patient reported outcomes? So I think ideally after surgery we need to focus more on both of these so that you have the ideal improvement right there on the diagonal. <clears throat> Well, what are patient reported outcomes? It's a hot topic these days. And by definition, it's any report of health status that comes directly from the patient without interpretation of the response by the clinician. And the FDA <clears throat> in their, in their um, guidelines actually state that patient input is required 
for a patient reported outcome measure to be valid. So what that means is you and I can't just pick the surveys off the shelf and say, you know, let's just give these to the patients and see what they have to say. The flaw there is that the patients may be experiencing something that we don't even know that they're experiencing, so we're not asking the questions. So you have to go to the source. And so all these prior studies of health-related quality of life in our lung cancer patients, they either used metrics that were generic, which still have value, like the SF36, because you can compare them to the general population, or they are applicable to patients with advanced stage lung cancer. So the oncologists are ahead of us. They've already come up with metrics. They take their patients. They ask them questions. They have nice, you know, great surveys and scales, but then some surgeons take them and apply them to their patients, which is really not appropriate because now you've got lung cancer surgery patients asking, uh, being asked questions like, how's, your, how's numbness and tingling and how's your hair loss and how's your sense of taste? That doesn't really make sense. So why should we, why should we measure these? Well, first and foremost, it's patient-centered care. So if we include these metrics into care, we have a comprehensive assessment of what actually happened after the operation from the patient's perspective. We could also better counsel our patients if we knew what their concerns were before and after surgery, which they might not always tell us. It may improve communication between surgeon and patient. There's data to support this uh, in the internal medicine world that patients had their um, problems addressed much more readily when they, were, when they filled these types of surveys out before their visit. We could also identify and address quality of life issues that we may miss in our standard post-op visit, which lasts about 15 minutes. And then we could measure the utility of clinical interventions that were actually trying to make their quality of life better. And eventually, some people think that this is going to be used as a performance measure. So you're going to be nationally benchmarked on how your patients think you did. And you're going to get feedback, and you'll have to work on performance improvement. And I think that's a real uh, possibility. So what is patient-centered care? Really, it just means that the individual specific health needs and their desired health outcomes are the driving force behind all the healthcare decisions we make and all the quality measurements that we do. And so it's not just about the clinical perspective, but it's about financial, emotional, social. There's so much more to it that goes on with the patient that we are oftentimes unaware of. And if you see in this diagram, the family is mentioned multiple times. Family is welcome. Patient and family always included in the decisions. Viewpoints respected and valued of the patients and their family. So I'd like to challenge you to think, are we really practicing patient-centered care? I'll give you an example of a patient that I saw in the office. He was 70 years old. He presented with cough shortness of breath. And long story short, he had an incidental finding of this mass um, down here in the chest wall. It was biopsied. It was a spindle cell tumor. So we took it out, reconstructed the, the defect. And on six-month follow-up, yeah, I was excited. He had no recurrence. He was doing well. He wasn't readmitted. All those metrics that I presented earlier were we're A-OK. -okay. But then I just happened to ask him as an afterthought, how are you doing? Are you, you're retired now, right? You're doing, are you up at your cabin doing those things you told me you were going to do? And he said, no. I said, well, why not? And he said, because I have pain. This is six months after surgery. And I was, I almost left the room and, and just thought to ask him this question. I thought, wow, I would have really missed that because I thought it was an A plus by all the other metrics that I had measured. But in his eyes, this surgery was, was not a success. He wasn't doing the things he wanted to do. I'm going to tell you something obvious. So this is kind of weaving in the establishing a research focus is Dr. Inadomi was one of my uh, attendings and research mentors at UCSF, and now he's at UW. And he just said, simply study the patients in front of you, the ones that you see most often in your practice, because those are the people that are going to give you ideas on how you can take better care of your patients, and they'll give you th thoughts on how to um, pose a research question. So don't pick the esoteric ones, especially when you're doing primary uh, data collection, like patient reported outcomes. You're, we're going to need numbers, so we're going to do lung cancer resection patients. That was what we're going to study, not um, you know thymectomies, for example, because they're not common. Also, a few years ago, I used a traveling fellowship to go to the University of Michigan, and it was there that um, I had the opportunity to uh, observe how this research machine works. It was impressive, and I met with Dr. Gaffari and Dr. Dimmick, Dr. Dimmick, and we talked 
literally I was with Justin for about 30 minutes and he, I said, you know, I'm, I'm studying readmissions after lung cancer surgery. And he said, well, first of all, that's going to run its course. Second of all, if you apply for these grants, you're going to be competing with health economists and you're a surgeon. And so what do you do? What are your strengths? And he said, he pointed out, your strength is your patients. You have access to the patients. You have access to the tissue. You have access to what they tell you and your interactions with them. So he's like, can you leverage something there that you're passionate about? And I told him about that patient. And he said, well, that's a perfect research focus. You should do that. And I said, but you know, can I make a research focus out? And he said, absolutely. So I met a lot of people and I met this person, another Wisconsinite. Um, and the new research focus was patient report outcomes after lung cancer resection and how can we how can we do it better so for the KL2 you know, long term my goal was to was to develop a patient report outcome uh, metric that was specific to our patients and eventually uh, implement it multi-center and then use that uh, for clinical trials and use that as the outcome measure to investigate how we're doing with these quality of life interventions and in the short term I need to I need to establish this metric, what, what are we going to ask these patients, how are we going to do this, and then how are we going to actually put it into clinical workflow. So again, establishing a research focus, it, you have to ensure that it's timely. So the whole readmission, that was timely, but it was going to fizzle out. Patient report outcomes, quality of life, this is not going away, and patient report outcomes are gaining momentum. This is a big movement right now, and so if you can, um, in your own specialties, if you can align your societal commitments with your research interests, you'll be in really good shape. So what I did was uh, several years back is I got myself onto the STS database task force because I'm interested in clinical outcomes and clinical research. And then if you show up and do the work, then you'll get promoted to a workforce on the national databases. And then the, the, the latest and greatest thing is that, oh, now we have a patient report outcomes task force because the leadership of the STS has committed to implementing patient report outcomes into our national database. And so uh, I'm excited to be someone, uh, a part of that task force, so I can sit at the table and help make those decisions and, and guide that effort. So going back to how do we do this? Well, aim one was how do I identify and understand which aspects of quality of life are important to these patients? Well, you ask them. So this is my first purview into qualitative research. And we did a prospective cohort study of these patients undergoing lung cancer surgery and we did in-depth interviews by telephone, because a lot of them live far away, at two and six months after surgery. Now, interestingly, I did not do the interviews, and we decided that for good reason, because there's actually a social desirability bias. The patients see you as um, someone they look up to and someone they should be appreciative of because you removed their cancer, and you have to, um, they're not, even no matter how good you are, they're not gonna share everything that they're thinking, and so, we had a sociologist, a PhD sociologist, do these, and reading the transcripts was really interesting because on the one hand, she would say, did your surgeon explain everything? Oh, yeah, my surgeon's great, great, great. They put you on a pedestal. And then the next breath, they would say, you know, I didn't expect this, and I wasn't told about this. So there's this real dichotomy about how they view their operation. And what you do is you, you go through and you, you take the transcribed report. You read every single one, actually several times, and you go through and you find chunks of text and you, and you code them into uh, you know, what, where, what category do they fit under. And so I'll get to those results in a minute, but you're always gonna have um, some dropout in a prospective study, but I'm fortunate that we had 25 patients that completed the first interview, which is a good number for qualitative research because the data are so rich. You, I mean, you have an hour to an hour and a half worth of a transcript for every single patient. Uh, we, not surprisingly, had more women than men Unfortunately, our, our cohort's not very diverse, and I wish we could improve upon that, but our, it's reflective of our patient population that we take care of. It was a range of pathologic stages, and then some patients uh, had chemotherapy as well, so that was uh, part, of the, part of the picture. This software that you enter the, the text data into can pull up a uh, what's a word cloud? You've seen these before, I'm sure. And the size of the font corresponds to how often that concept was, was discussed. So patients, it was surprising, throughout an entire interview, patients would just bring up their family and friend and how much they relied on that support. And also their 
general physical function. They did a lot of comparing how they did before surgery and what they could do now after surgery. And also, I just want to highlight preparing for surgery and expectations was a huge, huge part of the discussion. Just some excerpts, and just next to it is how many people mentioned this. So every single person talked about how their functioning is. Pain, one person said, I had no idea my ribs would hurt. My ribs still hurt and were two and a half months out. Social health was important. Instrumental support is, is just helpful in day-to-day -day activities. One person said, my granddaughter and daughter were there. They came to my house to help me do things. Emotional support was big. But interestingly, informational support and companionship were not, not as high up on the list. And in terms of emotional health, there was a lot of positivity. I think some of the pain and some of those negative experiences were offset by knowing that the cancer was gone and a sense of relief. But the negative, there was a lot of it was focused on the pain. I think the pain is the number one thing that affects my mood. I had some anxiety issues, some stress, getting overwhelmed. They had me work on breathing and controlling my breathing to calm me down. And that anxiety did help calm me and a lot of uh, and a lot, and it did help control some of the pain. So that's interesting. The nerve pain I'm experiencing now ticks me off when I hear reports that it can go as quickly as it came, can last a few months or your whole life, I get upset. So no qualitative study would be complete without a conceptual framework. That's what the sociologists tell me. This is the health-related quality of life after lung cancer surgery, and this is what we came up with. Really. Uh, the physical, emotional, and social health, they really interact. And I think we focus a lot on the physical, but we forget about the other two. So how, do we, how can we measure these, these things that the patients are experiencing? Well, fortunately, there's a system for this. And this is, uh, came out in the early 2000s. And it's the Patient Reported Outcomes Measurement Information System. And it's free, free to use the assessment center. Um, interestingly, Epic has this capability. Only very few um, institutions have turned it on because you have to pay extra. So they're a set of person-centered measures that evaluates and monitors physical, mental, and social health. And uh, there's so short forms. Some are as short as four questions, six questions, eight questions. And there's computer adaptive tests that ask, as when you answer a question, it asks a next logical question. So if, if you ask the patient, you know, can you get up and walk around your house, the next question is not going to be, can you run a mile? So you can see how you could do, uh, you can get a quicker assessment by adapting the test for each patient. So they're good for a range of patient populations. They can be used off the shelf. You don't need to retest them or you do psychometric evaluations on your patients to make sure that they fit. Um, they can be used for all types. And then you score them and then you compare it to the general population. So 50 equals the mean of the US general population. So it's a useful system. And these are the domains that they, that they cover in their system. And I just highlighted the ones that are common to our patients. So our next step, uh, Dave Cook and I are going to implement this into clinical workflow. And these are the ones I've chosen because they're the ones that came out uh, most frequently in the interviews. So how is this? How does this transition to a patient-centered approach to pain management? What, what's the next step? Well, this is what we know. There's lots of patients that are diagnosed with lung cancer every year. Many patients undergo surgery. Nearly all of our patients are asymptomatic when they come to us, and they don't have any pain. Lung cancer surgery is painful, regardless of how you do it. And then there are a lot of patients that develop chronic pain and persistently use opioids. So there's a problem. The other problem is how do we deliver healthcare right now? Well, currently we see a patient once or twice before surgery. The first visit is scrambling to get studies that they don't have yet. The second one is discussing the operation, we talk about risks and benefits. Frequently the patients stop me and say, I'm gonna be asleep, I don't need to know that. How long am I gonna be in the hospital is my recovery gonna look like? So they don't wanna know what the percent risk of bleeding or chylothorax or any of those things. Um, so it's kind of interesting. We have pain management protocols, we give them opioids at the time of discharge. We don't do a ton of patient education regarding pain control, and we don't measure any PROs. This is what they all ask every single time. So what about pain? Well, 
pain is significant after thoracotomy and also after VATS. And so this is a randomized trial of uh, VATS versus anterolateral thoracotomy. And what they found was that the proportion of patients with clinically relevant pain was significantly lower during the first 24 hours after VATS, but it was, it was still high, 38% versus 63%. But this is even more interesting. If you look at all the patients in the study, they followed them out to a year. And at a year, you still have seven and nine patients in each of these groups that have significant pain. That's a big deal. This study from Iowa is really interesting <clears throat> and really dense, but they tried to figure out, well, what are the predictors of chronic pain at six months after surgery? And the technical definition of chronic pain after surgery is, is two months. But they went out to six months, which is great, and so they measured all these um, all of these things in the preoperative assessment. And when I have NRS, it's the, you know, it's the numerical rating scale of zero to 10. And interestingly, there's a pain catastrophizing scale. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but as I reviewed the literature, it's important for orthopedics because those patients come to surgery with pain. And so they, some of them catastrophize and those patients do worse after surgery, but our patients don't know how to catastrophize because they don't have pain. So they just kind of threw the, threw the kitchen sink at this, but that's sometimes a way to do it. And this is what they assess, that the everyday post-up days one through three, three and six months, they really tried to hone in on what's your pain and what's the intensity. So these are the numbers that they found. So it's significant at three and six months, you have a high percentage of patients with pain after both VATS and thoracotomy. About three or four was what the level of pain was. But interestingly, at three months, pain limited the daily activities of people, like 16% of people, and still at six months it was 8%. So those are, those are high numbers. So what they found was that patients with a higher severity of pain, so despite the fact that they tested all those predictors, the only thing that really predicted pain at six months was how well their pain was controlled in the first three days. And then they did a post-doc analysis to say, well, who are these patients that are having pain in the first three days? Why is it out of control? Are there any predictors of that? And so the only, I found this very interesting. The only independent predictor of moderate to severe pain in the first few days after surgery was the pain that the patient's expected to have. So they asked them before surgery, what, what level of pain do you expect to have on post-up day one, two, three? And this is what they found. You can see in this column, the first, the column on your left is the patients who actually had moderate to severe acute pain after surgery, and then the ones on your right are those who had mild pain. And those who had moderate to severe, they had, they had expected higher pain. So expectations may play a role in this. And I don't know if you've ever had um, the experience where you're talking to a patient and, and they kind of hang on your every word. And I can tell you the extreme example is I was covering one weekend and one of Dr. Cook's patients uh, must have been told that she was going to be in the hospital for four days. And she looked good on post-up day two and I was trying to discharge her home. And she said, well, I was told I was going to go be here for four days. Shouldn't I stay two more days? And the answer is no. So you should... You know, think about what you say to patients because they really hang on to it and um, you'd be surprised at, at what they're thinking. As I go through these, I'm going to go through this like, kind of quickly, but one thing I want to tell you about establishing a research focus is not just find gaps, but find, that way, find ways that you can cross-cut across different silos of the literature. So when I went through the literature, there's this whole section on health-related quality of life in general <laughs> after thoracic surgery. Then there's a whole other bucket on pain. It's the anesthesiologists love to measure pain and pain intensity and its presence and its character, but not about how it impacts someone's life. And then there's this whole other bucket on opioid use because it's really exciting to get these databases with the prescriptions in them, but there's no patient reported outcomes in here. So there's not a good link across all three of those things, and there, there needs to be. So preoperatively, there's a lot on the slide, but I'm just going to suffice it to say that in a huge database of patients undergoing elective surgery, thoracic surgical patients were least likely to be on opioids before surgery. So they come to us, no pain, not on opioids. This major surgery um, and opioid use study showed that the highest, highest rate of opioid use was among thoracic surgical patients. It was 9% after thoracotomy and 6% after minimally invasive surgery, and it was just you know, these are, these are high numbers compared to all the other patients. If you zone in on cancer surgery, um, this was a retrospective study that studied opioid use and, and how much the <coughs> patients were actually using. Similar, 14%. So 14% of thoracic surgical patients are new opioid users after surgery, and it persists 
uh, greater than 90 days. <coughs> and these are some of the predictors that they, that they identified. Some of it was insurance related, some of it was income. So this is kind of the, this is the trend right now to do these types of database studies. And lung cancer specifically, 14% of opioid naive lung cancer patients continued to fill prescriptions 90 to 180 days after surgery. That's a lot. So when I reviewed the literature, I um, was invited to send in an uh, invited expert review to Annals of, of Thoracic Surgery. And this is uh, one of the diagrams I came up with, is we know all these predictors of new persistent opioid use because it's large database uh, studies. Chronic postoperative pain, not so much. We don't really understand what really predicts it. And then what's the link between the two? Because I can tell you, I have patients with pain at six months who aren't taking opioids because they won't do it. And I probably have patients taking opioids that don't have pain. So we don't know a lot about the crosstalk. In terms of patient education in post-op pain control, this is interesting. I just want you to take a look first at the bottom here. Let me do this. 1964. This is the coolest study I've read in a long time. It's a randomized trial of patients undergoing abdominal surgery. A long time ago, patients were admitted the day before surgery, the night before surgery. The anesthesiologist came to the bedside, talked to them, spent time with them, told them what to expect. And in this intervention group, they informed them about post-operative pain, what the present severity duration of it would be, and also taught them some techniques for how to manage it, breathing techniques, a whole host of things, how to think about it. And post-op day five, no difference in narcotic use, but days one, uh, post-op day zero, no difference, but one through five, patients in the inter intervention group use fewer narcotics. And they said, comparing these patients with the control group, we were able to reduce post-op narcotic requirements by half. This is, how about this for forward thinking? Each patient has his or her own psychologic makeup. Each patient needs special treatment tailored to meet his or her particular psychologic needs. Sounds like patient-centered care to me, but it wasn't happening back then. Maybe it still isn't happening today. Many reports have discussed that treatment of patients suffering um, after operation Narcotics are not without danger. They also vary considerably in effectiveness, and they're particularly not effective for neuropathic pain. So fast forward to a, a randomized trial done by one of my mentors at Michigan, uh, Dave Williams, and what he's developed is a, an internet-based self-management program for patients with chronic pain, in particular fibromyalgia. And it includes non-pharmacologic interventions that patients can use to help control their pain. Now, these are typically not used because who has time in clinic to talk about these things, right, and to teach patients how to do it? So this randomized trial showed that those in the intervention group had significant improvements in their average pain intensity. And a third reported a 30% decrease in their mean pain score. And only five patients needed to use the program to have a, this 30% responder rate, which was excellent. They also had better physical functioning. So again, establishing research focus, recycle <coughs> ideas. So adapt successful strategies and contents, concepts for other patients to your patients. Um, cross, you know, break down the silos, talk to other specialties, see what they're doing. And you can revisit the evolution of healthcare um, and healthcare delivery, which is what I was thinking. The historical model is early admission. We spend a lot of time talking to the patients. Now, we have a limited pre-op office visit. They arrive the day of surgery, and well, we have enhanced recovery, and we got to get them out post-op day one. So it's really an interesting cycle. And I think futuristically, you can re you can use your phone to dictate the rest of your life. You can get an Uber, you can get a Lyft, you can make your plane, or, you know, you can book your flight. But why can't why don't we have better systems for patients to use, and why don't we provide them with the information we want them to to use and know? So my long-term goal is to decrease chronic pain and reliance on opioids for pain control and improve quality of life for our patients. And in the short term, we have to identify patient and caregiver. What do they need? What do the patients need to know about pain management? What would help them? And then I can adapt my, my mentor's uh, internet bedside for our patients, and then we can pilot it and see if patients are actually happier and have less pain. And this is what it would kind of look like. There's a lot about... Um, pain in general and what it's about and what to expect. And then there's self-care modules, which is really trying to decrease the opioid use and trying to use other methods. There's a lot of things people don't know. And you, a lot of us know these things because we've been through it and we understand it. And then a little bit about the professional edu care education, like medications and regional blocks. And then eventually I'd like to add symptom monitoring um, and more resources, but we've got to start small and 
and scale up. We have a unique center here at UC Davis, which is the UC Davis Center for Design and the Public Interest. This is on the Davis campus, and it's led by Susan Verba, who's an amazing um, information designer. She has a Master's in Fine Arts, and she develops um, interesting, uh, user-friendly information, and, and she thinks about content. Now, these people are interesting because what they do is they have a special um, training, and they can listen to people talk, or the user or patients, and then they can develop um, content based on how they think the patient would use it. So one really tiny example that I'll give you is we've all taken flights all the time. How many of you listen to the flight attendants when they're given their safety instructions? I, I think it's a lot of hand waving, it's boring, I try to fall asleep. But if you ever flew Virgin America back in the day, they had this little, um, every single TV at the back of the seat had this really cool cartoon. For some reason, even when I tried not to watch it, it, it sucked me in because I thought the cartoon was really well done and it was really funny and I paid attention to it. So she designs things like that. So she designs things in a way that you are going to, you, you want to pick it up and you want to read it. So from an innovation standpoint, again, it doesn't have to be earth shattering, but in a nutshell, we need to have a patient-centered approach to pain management, which I don't think we have right now including the primary caregiver as a supporter. All these patients said, my family supports me, my family supports me. When you have the preoperative visit, the family member's always sitting right there. They want to help, they're taking notes. So why don't you provide them with something so they can co-pilot with you and you can extend your care outside of uh, your office. And then you really need to enlist the expertise of an information designer. Unfortunately, these people are usually called in as called web page designers or they're, they're brought in after the fact and we have this content, why don't you, um, you know, figure out how to make it pretty, and that's not really what their, what their role is. They know how to present the information in a way that promotes effective and efficient use of it. So the internet is powerful, right? Most of us have it, and 80% of people that have it are gonna search online for healthcare information. And within 50 milliseconds or less, a user will judge information presented as either negatively or positively. And despite the importance of that first impression, their first exposure um, is often overlooked. So we, we often ignore that. Let's see if I can get this link to work, but I just wanted to give you an example. And maybe is Manny here? In case I fall out of this. Let's see if this will, will it open or no? Thanks. Now, I have nothing against the American College of Surgeons whatsoever. I have a lot of respect for them, but they came up with this um, with this handout and I kind of cringed when I looked at it. Oh, it's really long. It, you can tell it, it was written by surgeons. <laughs> There's no information designer here. Um, see how, this is, this is where I really cringed. Nine out of 10 patients report that their pain is either mild or gone four days after surgery. What surgery? Oh my gosh, this, uh, if I gave that to a patient and, and then they still had pain, I would think, I'd feel terrible. So this is pretty dense. It's all branded, American College of Surgeons. Okay, non-medical therapies, complementary therapies, meditation guided imagery. Well, you're not really telling them what to do. You're just, patients aren't, no one's gonna pick up on that. I can guarantee you. And it keeps going and going. Yeah, even I can't take it. Okay, so it's a good attempt, but that's not, thank you. That's not how we need to be. We need to be doing it in a way that is more patient friendly. So there's potential for significant impact here on post-operative pain, opioid use, quality of life. We can provide patients with just not only education, but techniques to help manage their pain, uh, including using those primary caregivers that they have for support. Those people want to help. So let's take part of the healthcare paradigm and, and move it outside of the healthcare system infrastructure, so to speak. This is a practical and scalable healthcare delivery model. We don't have a lot of time to talk to our patients, so we need to have information packaged up for them that they're gonna to wanna to access and that they can access and they want to access um, at home in preparation for their surgery. And using these types of programs for pain control um, will help them better understand and manage their pain. But if you give them these tools, I think it's gonna empower people to be more of a, an active participant in their own, in their own care. So I'd like to thank the original CTSC 
uh, KL2 research team for all their help. Melissa Gosden was great. She was the one that did all the interviews. Um, she did an excellent job getting the information uh, that we needed from, uh, from those interviews. And my new research team for the KO8, which is to be determined, <laughs> submitted on February 12th. Um, Dr. Palmieri has been super helpful, and she's my primary mentor for this. She's got expertise in uh, conduct of clinical trials and health-related quality of life. And if you look at this team, you can see that you know, there's only one thoracic surgeon on it, which is Felix Fernandez and Emory. And this is really about team science. So don't be afraid to fill your, load your boat with people who have expertise in areas that you don't have expertise in. It's, it's critical because that's how you can do the most impactful research, I think. So that was my view for the last week. It's Canada. It's pretty. <laughs> and I want to go back. <laughs> That's not Wisconsin. No, there's a lot more snow in Canada. <laughs> and it sticks well, around. Dr. Brown, that was really great and really a nice, um, so important to, for all of us to think about what, what really does affect our patients. You're right. We're all proud of ourselves. You know, yay, yay, yay. We got it out. But, you know, if, if they are living with their complications or something else, really, that's, that's what counts. That's what counts to all of us. Yeah. Really great. Um, questions? Great opportunity. We'll start with Dr. Young. Yeah. So that, that was a nice presentation, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, what, how, how does the pain after lung cancer surgery compare with other uh, operations? For example, orthopedic surgery versus uh, major abdominal surgery or minor abdominals or, or laparoscopic surgery. I mean, are, the, are those indices compatible or comparable in your view? Yeah, I think um, it's hard to say that because with those opioid studies, that whole body of literature, they compare all the different operations and thoracic surgeries in the lead in terms of using opioids. But for pain, typically those studies studied one cohort of patients, so thoracic surgical patients or orthopedic patients, and they didn't really intermingle them. But I can tell you that with the carrot and the stick approach of patient reported outcomes, um, that orthopedics is furthest along in terms of measuring patient reported outcomes and doing these types of interventions and quality of life because, because they had to be, because Medicare said you're, you're going to do it. So they are doing it and what they have is they actually have a profile and they can take a patient with um, knee pain before knee replacement and they can figure out what factors are gonna predict how well they're gonna do after surgery because they have so much data um, on patient part outcomes and pain after surgery, that they can predict, well, I'm gonna do this knee replacement and you're gonna probably end up here, or you're gonna end up here. We have nothing like that. And so there's not a lot of comparison between, between the specialties, unfortunately. But I can tell you that thoracic surgery is a focus because as you know, rib spreading, operating between the ribs um, can be painful. And it's not all neuropathic. About almost half of it is, but a lot of it's not. First of all, congratulate you on the topic selection. I, I mean, I think it really both it combined both patient reported long term outcomes and opioid abuse. The combination together is very compelling for current um, healthcare outcomes research in America. Um, so number one. Number two, can you, can you expand on when you're talking about internet based questions? Are you talking about one of the commercially available apps or are you talking about designing another one or mixing in with Epic? just wasn't sure where you're going with that part. Sure. The measurement, um, so the, the patient report outcome measurement information system was uh, born out of a mission, um, a goal of the NIH. So it was Dave Sella and the work group at Northwestern are the ones that came up with promise. And so when I, when I discussed this with my KL2 mentors, they said, oh, don't, do not start from scratch. You, you know, coming up with your own metric from scratch is going to be really hard because then you'd have to choose the questions and, and evaluate its psychometric properties in your patients. So they said it's already been done. They've put so much money into this, you know, NIH funded promise system that you should just you should use that. So that's what people are doing. They're using that. What you do is you you see what they have available. You can download all of the surveys for every single domain um, onto your computer and you can read them all. And what I was talking about was assembling a um, several let's say five, let's say these are the five most important ones, and that would be the patient report outcome measure, 
would be these five surveys we're going to give to every single patient because those are the ones that matter to them. And then what you can do is you send those to an assessment center and they score it for you. Now, that all has to be done in parallel right now. I went to the Health Information Users course in Northwestern and learned from the experts. And right now you can either do it uh, like in red cap, so you're running parallel to your EMR, and that's how most people are doing it because their healthcare system isn't turning on the, the system in Epic. But places like WashU, uh, Northwestern, they're, it's top down. You know, their chief quality officers are, are on top of it. So they've, everyone's measuring it and it's pretty commonplace. So you come to the hospital, everyone, every specialty is measuring these things. So it is an Epic. You can turn it on and Promise is in Epic. You can use it. And just last comment I'll just make, I imagine you know this, but within UC Davis, one of the other clinicians who's a big advocate for this is Laura Randall, the chair of orthopedics. He came from a background in Utah where he was uh, prominent yeah. in the development of their patient reported outcomes metrics. Utah's also, yeah, they're also leading. Well. Lisa, I enjoyed your talk. I actually have two questions, and I'll preface it by saying we actually looked at this uh, in vascular patients a couple years ago. We found that there was actually a surprising number of vascular patients who were on narcotics prior to procedures, but the, the number went up afterwards, even for cases that you wouldn't expect the numbers to go up to, things like angioplasty or varicose veins and so forth. And I think you sort of touched upon it because there's a difference between managing pain and using narcotics as, as an outcome because it, it's so complex. So two questions. First, here at this institution, they do a lot of cryoblation of the intercostal nerves. What's the data for that to, to, um, to impact pain, pain for thoracotomy patients, both short-term and long-term? Second question, has there been any data looking at the types of narcotics that are used early on and the narcotic and the opiate use down the road? Because some opiates have much more of a euphoric effect, and perhaps you can sort of ferret out some of the differences between, you know, the reasons for taking them. Yeah, those are great questions. So the cryoablation, we've had these discussions within our division, and I want to say I'll defer to Dr. Raff, but I think the pediatric, it's been efficacious in his group. But when I reviewed the literature for adults um, before, and I, and I don't use cryoablation, it, the data were, I thought, inconclusive. And I didn't, I didn't think it supported it. In fact, I almost thought that it went against it because there are some patients that you do cryoablation on and they actually end up with chronic pain as a result of the cryoablation. So I've steered away from it because I, I just don't think the data are great for adults. In terms of the type of opioids and, and causing that uh, euphoric effect, we haven't, that's a great question and that hasn't been addressed yet. Uh, the studies of the opioid use that I showed, those are all market scan databases and uh, multi-center databases that have medication, you know, prescription information in them. And they didn't really drill down on the type, except to most people normalize it to morphine equivalents in terms of amount, but not the type. So that would be an interesting question to address. But I agree, I think what, what struck me when I talked to my patients is a lot of patients, they understand, they're afraid. They're afraid to become addicted, so they're not taking it, but they have pain. And then there's those that are taking them, but probably don't have pain, and then there are those who have, have both. And we don't, nobody knows those numbers yet. So just to talk a little bit about the cryo, full ex, uh, disclosure, I'm a consultant for Atricure. And the reason I'm a consultant is because I was so impressed with um, the addition of cryo. It's really not super well studied. That's one of the problems, but a lot of other specialties use it besides, uh, you know, besides surgeons in this room, orthopedic surgery, ENT surgery. And I don't think any single measure or any single uh, thing you do is going to be enough. It's got to be a multimodal approach. A lot of the pain that we see, for instance, with the NUS procedure, what I've mostly been involved with is cryo for the NUS patients. And... You know, it was pretty dramatic. It wasn't just the cryo that helped. It was preoperative um, teaching. You know, we, we went back to ortho, actually, ortho spine, and looked at their protocols and reviewed everything they did. And then we went back and looked at what the data was to support it. And we instituted all of that. And we dramatically reduced our length of stay, our opioid use, um, and our post-op pain. 
So I think all of it's really important. Um, a lot of the pain, for instance, in us patients have is not really responsive to narcotics. We've been throwing narcotics at them for decades. It's more responsive to Valium because it's muscle spasm. So, you know, I was going to ask how, how much as far as other modalities are you guys starting to introduce now? Because I get that you're, you're not enthusiastic about cryo because you can pick any study you want, adult thoracic surgery, just using cryo, and you'll find any data you want to support what you want to do. But there aren't really many multimodal approaches in thoracic, and I think that's what we're missing. Yeah, we, we do use a multimodal approach because that's, that's pretty much standard of care right now. So we use Tylenol um, around the clock, NSAIDs, gabapentin, and we try to minimize the opioids, and we've even gotten away from PCAs. Uh, there's been an evolution in thoracic surgery. It used to be all about the epidural in terms of if you did a thoracotomy, and then that changed to um, now we do a regional block. Usually it's an erector spinae block, and that's the anesthesiologist will do that before surgery or, or shortly thereafter, and those, those are very effective. But I have had patients that it was effective for the first several days, and the chest tube came out, they took the block out, the patient went home, and then they were suffering. So that's something to think about, too. It is, and the times I've tried to order Robaxin here, they, I get pushed back from pharmacy. Um, but I think the muscle spasm is a big, big part of it, too. Last comment. Uh, two comments. Dr. Palmieri and So first, I'd like, I, I, I'd like to congratulate you, and I hope everyone was listening to your description of how you developed your research plan, because that is how it, the right way to do it. You start with something that's important to your patients, that's important to you, and you get the data, you get develop the connections, you identify the, the right ways to go when you get the right mentoring teams. That, that's, that's classic to do it. Um, in terms of my question, um, your family has a big impact on how you perceive pain and how your health-related outcomes uh, occur. <laughs> how would you envision moving forward in the future? Because obviously you, you're on a great pathway looking at the patient piece, but looking at how that, their family and how our education of the family influences their uh, pain and outcomes. So I, th I think it just in our preliminary data, it was interesting that <clears throat> the patients didn't talk a lot about informational support. So they weren't right now relying on their, the people at home with them for informational support. Although sometimes you'll have patients, there's only a couple of people that mentioned it was helpful that my you know, family member came with me, took notes and did all these things. But I think that, I think that that could change if we provided the right information and, and and basically gave them the resources and the tools that they need, that then they could rely on that person. I think there's a huge um, benefit to this because when you have surgery and you're taking these, some of these medications, you're not <clears throat> thinking clearly, you don't feel good, you're not, maybe you don't feel like logging into your computer, you, you know, the, all this takes energy to look things up, right? So if you could have a co-pilot in your home that has the information for you and could help guide you through it, because they're feeling good and, and they're there to help you, I think that's where it comes into play. So we want to rely on the patient, the patient, the patient, but sometimes the patient's just not feeling up to it. So that's where the person next to them comes in handy, and I think there's a huge role there. And I don't think it's been, I don't think that resource of that provider at home has been leveraged enough yet. All right, Dr. Kovac. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, how much of pain perception is from our constant bombardment of the patient with, what's your pain level? What's your pain level? Yeah. And would it be more effective and perhaps better, at least for some patients, to instead of having that, but to say, have a more positive, like how comfortable are you today? What can I get to make you more comfortable rather than w how much pain are you having? Um, because pain in many ways is a negative word, whereas something like comfortable is much more of a positive word. I think it's a great question. It, it makes me think, I, I read in several of these opioid papers and books that we're to blame <clears throat> because we made it the sixth vital sign. So, and all of a sudden, it's all about the pain, right? And, and we gotta make the patient happy. And they, the pain has to be, you know, set, we're setting unrealistic expectations is what we're doing. I like the thought of spinning it positive. On the flip side, I will tell you something that I 
wanted to mention with the interviews was if the patients had pain or shortness of breath and it was significant, but we told them about it before surgery, they told the interviewer, yeah, I'm not really bothered by it because my surgeon told me it's going to get better. So they, they were fine being short of breath and they were fine in pain you know, or almost accepting of it. But if they had cough or numbness and we forgot to tell them that they would have numbness here or they might develop a cough, they were, they were seeking out health care. They were calling people and saying, I think something's wrong. Nobody told me I was going to have. So there's got to be a balance between what, you know, the expectations, but then you're right, not focusing on it so that we bombard patients. And as a caveat to that, I was going to say I'm old enough to remember before we had pain as a fifth vital sign. And there was a different perception, I think, both by patients as well as in what we prescribed. Yeah. Great topic, great interest, and cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.